The Buddha had many disciples who were old cultivators, senior members of the assembly who had much more way virtual than Ananda. Ananda had just recently attained the fourth stage of a hardship, while among the assembly were many who had been had long been fourth stage of hearts. If Ananda had simply spoken the sutras, most of them would not have played, have paid him due respect. But by saying, Thus I have heard, he made it clear that what they were about to hear was not a sutra spoken, spoken by Ananda himself, but rather a sutra he heard the Buddha speak, therefore no one could argue. Everyone knew that Ananda had the most excellent memory and could remember in their entirety all the sutras the Buddha had spoken during his 49 years of teaching without getting them confused or mixed up in any way. Ananda was born on the Buddha on the day of the Buddha's enlightenment. He heard everything the Buddha taught during the last 29 years of his life and remembered every single word of it. But how could he remember what the Buddha taught during the first 20 years, someone may ask. He wasn't even there to hear the teaching. Remember that Ananda was the Buddha's personal attendant and never left the Buddha's side. He used every opportunity to question the Buddha about the earlier teachings and in this way he learned all the Dharma the Buddha had spoken during those first 20 years. The Buddha's teaching was like a great river, every drop of it flowed into the ocean of Ananda's mind. Not a single drop escaped. That is why it is said that everything the Buddha taught during all the 49 years from his enlightenment to his nirvana was perfectly preserved in Ananda's memory. Thus, the disputes of the assembly were quelled. Non-Buddhist texts begin either with the word O, existence, or the word E, non-existence. They say that all phenomena are either existent or non-existent. But the Buddhist sutras speak of true emptiness and wonderful existence, the doctrine of the middle way. They avoid the extreme doctrines of existence and non-existence being and non-being. They begin with thus I have heard to distinguish them from non-Buddhist texts. Sutra At one time the Buddha dwelt at the city of Shravasti in the sublime abode of the Jetta Grove. Commentary At one time refers to the time when the Suragama Sutra was spoken. It was the appropriate time to speak the sutra. Why wasn't the specific year, month, and day, and time recorded, you ask? Since the calendars of India and China did not coincide, there was no way to fix the time the Suragama Sutra was spoken. So the simple phrase at one time was chosen. Of the six fulfillments, at one time brings about the fulfillments of time, and the Buddha as the host who speaks the drama is the fulfillment of a host. If you want to become a Buddha, you must learn what a Buddha is like. What is a Buddha like? A Buddha is happy from morning to night. He doesn't worry. He doesn't give rise to afflictions. He sees all living beings as Buddhas, and so himself, he himself has already has realized Buddhahood. If you can see all living beings as Buddhas, you too are a Buddha. What does the word Buddha mean? The word Buddha means enlightened. The Buddha has perfected the three kinds of enlightenment. Enlightenment of self, enlightenment of others, and the perfection of enlightenment and practice. This has been explained above. In this sutra, the terms of the three kinds of enlightenment are called basic enlightenment, initial enlightenment, and ultimate enlightenment, but these are simply different names for the enlightenment of self, the enlightenment of others, and the perfection, the perfection of enlightenment and practice. In Buddhist sutras, 
There are many places where the names vary but the meaning is the same. You should not fail to recognize something just because the name is different. If someone changes his name, you won't know he is being referred to when someone mentions him by his new name. But when you meet him face to face, you'll say, Oh, it's you. The three kinds of enlightenment of the Buddha are the same way. If you haven't investigated the Buddha drama deeply, then you won't know what basic enlightenment, initial enlightenment, and ultimate enlightenment are. But if you have studied, have studied the Buddha drama, you know that they are the same as the three enlightenments. That is a general explanation of the word Buddha. If the word Buddha were discussed in detail, it could not be completely explained in three years, let alone three months. Now I have no alternative but to explain it for three minutes and let it go at that. That is because Americans lack speed. They want everything to be done fast. So now in lecturing the sutra, I will do it fast, like a rocket going to the moon. In a rocket jet, you're there. Although basically I hold to the old ways, I can't use the antiquated methods. The Buddha dwelt at the city of Shravasti. Shravasti, a Sanskrit word, was the name of the capital city of which King Prasenayit lived. The Buddha tortured and transformed many living beings there while he dwelt in the Saplam, a board of the Chetan Grove, which was near the city. Shravasti was different from other cities in that it was unusually full of pleasures involving the five objects of desire forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and objects of touch. All were extremely fine. As to forms, there were probably many beautiful women, and the city itself was undoubtedly very colorful. As to sounds, the music was probably extremely beautiful. As to smells, there was Indian curry, for instance, which we also have in this country and which can be smelled for quite a distance when it is cooking. As to flavors, there was ghee, a delicious milk product. As to objects of touch, they probably had the finest silks, the epitome of elegance in Shravasti. The city had abundance and affluence, and the people had the virtues of education and freedom. Thus, Shravasti is interpreted as meaning abundance and virtue. The people were well educated, well read, and well and experienced. They were endowed with intelligence, penetrating insight and scholarship. They were also a free pupil. They were not bound by others. Once there was a drama master who went to seek instruction from an elder drama master. When he arrived, he put on his robe and sash, opened his kneeling cloth, knelt before the elder drama master and asked for instruction. What instruction do you want from me? asked the old master. I am seeking freedom, came the reply. Who's biting you up? the old master asked. As soon as he heard the question, the young drama master realized that no one was biting him and he immediately became enlightened. I am already free, he realized. What I am doing seeking further freedom, that realization brought about his enlightenment. If I were to speak instruction in how to obtain freedom and someone were to tell me that I am not bowed up, would I become enlightened, you ask. That's different. Your time has not yet arrived. Your potential has not yet matured. When it does, one sentence will cause you to awaken, to connect suddenly and penetrate through to enlightenment. The people of Shravasti were free, which means that their cultivation made it easy for them to realize the way. Because Shravasti was so well endowed with abundance and virtue, the Buddha dwelt there. The Saplam, a part of the Jetta, Jetta Grove, is a Jetta Grove in the garden of the
the benefactor of orphans and the solitary mentioned at the beginning of the Vara Sutra. In Sutra Basti, there lived a great elder named Sudatta, who was endowed with many blessings. No one knew the extent of his wealth. One day, a friend said to Sudatta, A Buddha is at such and such a place speaking Dharma. The moment Sudatta heard the word Buddha, his hair stood on end and he was beside himself. I want to go see the Buddha right now, he said immediately. Because of his wish to see the Buddha, the Buddha shone his light on Sudatta, although he was a good distance away. It was the middle of the night, but because the Buddha's light was shining on him, Sudatta thought it was already dawn, so he arose and set out to see the Buddha. Since it was actually the middle of the night, the city gates were still locked, but by means of the power of the Buddha's spiritual penetrations, the gates opened of themselves when Sudatta arrived and closed behind him again as he went out. He reached his destination, saw the Buddha, and hear the Buddha speak drama, was inexpressibly happy. Then he asked the Buddha, You have so many disciples, where do they live? At that time, there wasn't any sublam aboard of the Jetta Grove, the Buddha said. I haven't any permanent residence. residence. I will build you a um, monastery, said the elder. I will make a place for you. Since he was wealthy, he could speak with authority. As soon as I return, I will find a place and begin construction. When he got back to Shravasti, he looked everywhere until he eventually found Prince Jetta's garden, which was about a mile and a half outside of the city. He saw that the garden was the most appropriate place to give the Buddha, but it belonged to the prince, so he went to negotiate. Why do you want to buy my garden? Prince Jetta asked. I'm going to build a place to invite the Buddha to live in replied the elder. All right, Prince Jetta said in jest, cover the grounds of the garden completely with gold coins, and I will sell it to you. It never occurred to the prince that Sudatta would actually do it. Who would have guessed that Sudatta would return and take all the gold coins from the family storehouses to the gardens to be laid out on the grounds? I was just kidding cried the prince when he saw the gold laden ground. When he saw the gold laden ground. How could I sell you my garden? You shouldn't have taken me seriously. You are a prince now, replied the elder Sudatta. In the future you will be the king. A king does not speak in jest. You can't joke with me. Whatever you say should be just as it is. You can't refuse to sell. When the prince heard that, there was nothing he could do. Very well, he said. You have covered the ground with gold coins, but you didn't cover the trees. Here's what we will do. We will divide it. The ground you covered is yours, but the trees are mine. However, I don't want them for myself. I'll make, it, make a gift of them so you can provide a place for the Buddha. The elder Sudatta had no choice but to accept Prince Jetta's conditions. So the place was named the Jetta Grove in the garden of the benefactor of orphans and the solitary. Sudatta was also known as Anathapindaka, the benefactor of orphans and the solitary, because he took pleasure in helping widows, widowers, orphans, and the solitary, that is, elderly couples who had no children. His virtuous deeds earned him a title awarded to elders of great virtue. How is Prince Jetta's name explained? Prince Jetta was born on the day his father, King Prasenayit, returned victorious from a battle with a neighboring country. So the child was given the name Jetta. 
Victorious in War by his father, the king. This is the history of the South Lama board of the Chetan Grove. Sudatta invested large additional sums of money in the construction of the Savlam abode. Sutra, with a gathering of bishu, of great bishus, 1250 in all. Commentary The gathering of great bishus together with the great ahas and the bodhisattvas of the ten directions mentioned below bring about the fulfillment of an audience. The sutras spoken by the Buddha are not confused or disconnected. They were spoken casually. Every sutra has its six fulfillments at the beginning because only when these six are brought about can a drama assembly be established and the drama be spoken. Great bishus are different from small bishus. Great bishus are at the stage in their cultivation where they are just about to attain enlightenment. Bishu is a Sanskrit word that has three meanings, mendicant, frightener of Mara, and destroyer of evil. A Bishu is a mendicant who takes his bow out into the streets to collect alms. He does not go only to the wealthy and avoid the poor or vice versa. A Bishu must practice equality in his alms rounds, which means he must go strictly from door to door and to no more than seven houses. So it is said, one should not avoid the poor and go to the rich, nor ignore the lowly and seek out the honorable. When someone ascends the precept platform to receive the Bishu precepts, he faces three masters and seven certifiers. The three masters are the precept transmitter, the Kamadana and the teaching transmitter. The seven certifiers act as a guarantors that, as a monk, the bishu will not violate the rules of pure eating or break the precepts. When the precepts are transmitted, the Kamadana asks, Have you already reserved to attain Bodhi? The answer is, I have already reserved to attain Bodhi. He also says, Are you a great hero? The answer to be given by the precept is, Yes, I am a great hero. When the questions have been answered in this way, an earth-traveling Rakshasa ghost, a being of our world, who records good and evil, says, Now the Buddha's retinue has increased by one, and Mara's retinue has decreased by one. The earth-traveling Rakshasa transmits this news to a space traveling Yaksha ghost, who in turn transmits the news through space to the sixth desire heaven where Mara dwells. When Mara, who is king of the heavenly demons, hears the news, he is terrified. That is why the second meaning of Bhikshu is the frightener of Mara. A Bhikshu is also a destroyer of evil because he breaks up the evils of ignorance and afflictions. Since the word Bishu has three meanings, it falls in the category of terms not translated because they contain many meanings, and according to the rules of translation, translation as set down by Dharma Suan during the Tang Dynasty in China, it is left in Sanskrit.